Thank you very much for this warm introduction. Uh, my name is Yoav Shalush, and I have a very difficult assignment to follow up a wonderful presentation by Ambassador Kim. Uh, once you finish your duty here, I would like to suggest to our foreign office to recruit you to be our ambassador in Korea. Uh, you know both sides extremely well. So thank you. We, we, we are honored by that. Um, as mentioned, I, I work both on the micro business level as the managing co-managing partner of Aviv Venture Capital. My partner, Dr. Gutman, is here with us as well. And also at the industry level, I'm a co-chair of Israel Advanced Technology Industries. So I've been learning a lot about the macro side of, of our industry. And with that, uh, a few words about this collaboration. When we were initially approached by the embassy uh, to see if we would like to enter, it, indeed, a joint venture to create an Israeli-Korean startup, uh, we were a bit amazed. Uh, the topic of Israeli collaboration from the Israeli point of view historically was just look, looking at importing uh, product from Korea. And our view was that we cannot import any more, any more Hyundai cars or any more Samsung displays or phones. I mean, everybody owns one by now. Uh, to which uh, the embassy told us, well, let's look at the high-tech sector. Uh, and indeed, that brought about some very interesting results, which I want to describe. So much so, that in a recent talk, which I will show now, we have suggested to the, the Kohler Institute of Venture, which is domiciled in the Tel Aviv University, and has received a significant several million dollar grant to look at the venture uh, community, that one of the topics for research should indeed be the Israel-Korea model, and what to learn from it, and, and how to adapt it further. So some of this talk is taken from that uh, situation. Uh, as as uh, the ambassador said earlier, uh, Israel and uh, Korea are in many ways similar, but also in many ways different. Uh, however, the issue is how do we find uh, synergy between our different nations, our different economies, which basically means what can we learn from each other, what can we more importantly leverage each other, which will be the, basically the core that I will focus on during this talk, and can, can we and should we develop new business models to make sure that... Uh, we're successful. So that's an iPhone, not a Samsung phone. <laughs> um, so just to respond to uh, the overall macro statistics, as you probably know, uh, we have about 8 million inhabitants in Israel, which is smaller than the city of Seoul, with an area of 20,000 square kilometers. Uh, our GDP per capita is almost the same as Korea, as mentioned uh, earlier, and our economic growth rate has been lately 3.3%, which was higher before that, and now is around the 3%. We have recently joined the OECD after Korea, and uh, that has done wonders for our economy because it forces us to benchmark everything uh, we do. Uh, we're still below, a bit below the GDP per capita of the OECD, but hopefully getting there. The interesting part, if you look at our economy, when you focus on the high-tech sector, uh, you probably know Israel is a trading nation, so we import a lot and we export a lot. Our, our internal market is very limited, obviously. And uh, it is claimed that the high-tech high engine over here employs about one quarter of a million people. I'm still looking to verify that number. I still think it's too high. It's about 10% of our workforce. But the most interesting statistic here, by far the most dynamic, is the fact that last year we reached a point where 51% of Israel's industrial exports were classified as high-tech. That means that we are the most high-tech dependent nation in the world today. So that is good news because everybody is trying to get to this point. It is bad news because we don't know where we go from here. So it, it presents both a wonderful accomplishment but an unbelievable channel and a, a challenge. And to quote uh, the ambassador, the problem in this is that there is nobody to copy. So we need to develop our own manual, if you will, in our own model. Uh, we, are, oh, we, the high-tech sector, is also the highest contributor to the GDP growth in the country, and we represent about 15% of GDP. Uh, let me just skip to this and I'll come back. Um, this ecos the ecosystem of the high-tech, which I'll come back to in a minute, is comprised of two types of enterprises, two buckets, about 50-50 in terms of the people they employ. The startup side, which many of you know and was talked about earlier, the, start the startup nation, that is about 4,800 startups, of which almost 800 are financed by professional uh, uh, firms, VC firms, and the rest are financed by, by what the industry calls Triple uh, F, which I'm sure you know, which is, stands for friends, family, and fools. 
and, uh, and sometimes corporations and strategic uh, partners. Uh, as you know, we are the second largest, we used to be the second largest foreign issuer in NASDAQ um, after Canada. Now there's China that's bigger than both Canada and us, obviously. Um, and I'll talk about the M&A uh, exits in a minute as, as we get to that. The most important accomplishment, which is the basis for future success, uh, and I'll dwell on that, is the concept of an ecosystem. And what ecosystem means that you have in, in one market, in one environment, all the necessary ingredients that are necessary for success, some of them physical, some of them corporate, some of them legal, some of them institutional, some of them cultural, and they all reside next to each other. They don't necessarily like each other. They collaborate on an ad hoc basis. And some, some uh, people have tried to somehow find a measure for the ecosystem, which is complicated because it's a bit like measuring a jungle and saying which jungle is better than the other jungle. And I'm not sure how one measures that. But nevertheless, a few metrics have been created. And within these metrics, I'm not sure you could see that, but let me just point to the fact that the number one ecosystem, these are all the parameters, the number one ecosystem in the world is Silicon Valley. Number two is called Tel Aviv, which is probably, well, you know, Tel Aviv is Israel pretty much. And then Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, and, and so on and so forth. So of the top six, the only non-US ecosystem is uh, in Israel. And note that ecosystems are usually large urban areas, you know, like San Francisco, like the Valley, which is pretty much, uh, uh, or Los Angeles for that matter, not, not necessarily uh, nations. So this creation of an ecosystem, which, which we never, never planned. planned, it's things that happen, you promote, you assist, I'll talk about the government role in a minute, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's there. Um, in terms of size, uh, the industry invests about $2 billion per annum in venture capital, three-fourths uh, four, three of that comes from funds. And the way we make our money back is through exits. Um, last year was a huge year because out of the $10 billion number you see here, half was a single deal where Cisco bought an Israeli company in Jerusalem. So, but, so the number was about four and a half to $5 billion. For the first three quarters of this year, we're already above that number. So we've, had, uh, we've done more than last year. And the size of the exits is growing. Last year, for the first time, there were five exits worth more than $400 million each per transaction. And we have about 10 companies or 12 companies in the pipeline to go public in NASDAQ. The first one was last week, Wix, same day as uh, Twitter, I think. Big mistake to, uh, to try to go public the same day as Twitter. Um, but nevertheless, it happened. So this year will probably be a very significant, very strong record year, both in mergers and acquisitions uh, and in IPOs. From a domain perspective, uh, these colors depict the different areas, uh, all the way from uh, software, uh, life sciences, and internet. So it's, we, we are in multi-disciplines. We are no longer in the stage where we were in our early days, where a lot of the technologies were based on know-how coming from the army or from the defense. It's still, it's still there, but not as dominant or not as important as it used to be. We are relying on the talent, the human talent that's developed there, but not so much on the technologies. Um, R&D spending here is, uh, is very big uh, in terms of the percentage of GDP on R&D, in terms of the uh, public expenditure on education. The importance of education in this country is pretty much like in Korea, uh, where mothers push their children to learn a lot. It doesn't always help, but uh, they try. Um, and we've already had six Nobel Prize laureates in the last 10 years although many of them have been in chemistry rather than technology. Uh, I've said that we have two buckets in our uh, country. One is the startup bucket. The second bucket is the multinational research and development centers, which employ 45% of the people in the industry. Uh, we all know these names. Most of them are US-based. Many of them were created by buying a company in Israel and then developing that to be a bigger uh, R&D center. It does work, I'll give you an example. EMC bought a company here that had, I think, 150 to 200 people. Today they have almost 1,000. So creating a base is very important. Microsoft is another example. Microsoft has 25 R&D centers in the world. Only three outside the US are, are considered strategic by, the, by Microsoft, and they are based in China, India, and in Israel. 
Uh, now, these R&D centers are based not on cost. Historically, we had a cost advantage over the U.S. We no longer have it. So the advantage should be in breakthrough thinking, in innovation, in time to market, uh, but not uh, from a cost basis. Uh, Samsung, as you know, is here. There are a couple of Chinese companies operating here as well. But clearly, if there's an area that needs improvement, apropos of our call, is to have more R&D centers uh, jointly or having more Korean uh, uh, companies come over here so that we can start to work together. And I recognize that there is a problem of visa. Uh, if it helps you, I know that Microsoft is also pushing the point. They're having a tough problem bring, bringing people over here. And we're working with the um, Ministry of the Economy to try to um, solve that. Another two words about us before I come to uh, the issue of Korea. We've been working together and trying to compare notes between us and the our Korean colleagues. Uh, the IATI, which I'm a chair of, tries to be an industry organization that reflects the full ecosystem. So you find in it the government, the venture capital groups, um, the technology transfer organizations of the different universities, incubators, accelerators, uh, and uh, academia, and so on and so forth. And we've been promoting a lot of agenda. For example, one of the most successful ones has been to accelerate collaboration between universities and industry, which in the past was not very good. Uh, we also try to represent the industry in our link with the government. As was mentioned here, the government here has a very successful record for many years now uh, of collaborating and supporting our industry, uh, whether it is for early stage, whether it's for R&D, whether it's binational R&D platforms, whether it's multinational ones. So there's a whole toolkit of capabilities that uh, is out there. And what I'm often asked in Korea and also now in Hong Kong, I came back last night, the question is, does Israel have a central place where decisions are taken, whether it's an industry association or whether it is the government that does that? And actually, I was asked again and again, do you have a control tower? That was the word that was used. So the answer is, no, we do not. We do not because it doesn't work like that, and we do not because the people in Israel uh, are no good uh, when it comes to discipline. So we don't listen to anybody. We're very bad at that. You put three Israelis in a room, you get five opinions. And I tried to look for an explanation. Uh, my, only, my only proposal was that for 2,000 years, we were dispersed in 70 different countries before coming back to Israel. So for 2,000 years, we did not have a king, we did not have a pope, we never had a central authority, and we got used to it that it can work without that. Um, I won't deliberate more. The, the uh, ambassador has covered some of the key success points of, uh, of creating a good ecosystem. Maybe one I will mention is the cultural one. Uh, historically, you know, your family would push a young person to become a lawyer or a doctor. Now it is an entrepreneur who is the top of the list. And that is a cultural change that promotes risk-taking, that promotes uh, trying new things, and uh, enough said about the, the willingness to also support people when they fail and looking at the failure as a, a point from which to work on. Um, I, I will skip the point about collaboration between academia and industry or, or um, um, the army and the industry, but just to tell you that some of the most successful companies in Israel, uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals, Mobili, who are doing uh, collision, um, collision avoidance systems, and I know there are three ventures in Korea now trying to do the same, but cheaper. Uh, and even the creation of given imaging uh, for the medical field came from either military or uh, academia. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to, to, to move to the last point and then talk about the joint uh, sessions. Um, as we look at the creative economy, it was mentioned here that we need to look beyond beyond just technologies, not just technology. And I've looked at two more factors that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one is, does all this talk about technology create a better world? Are we helping people? And to my mind, the answer is yes. You have a few technologies that Israel was involved in, all the way from 3D printing to firewall technology, which really enables the uh, internet today. Uh, and we think that our lives are enabled or are made better in our daily lives through this technology. And even more so when you look at the medical device uh, environment, those of you who know the stents that were developed in Israel, which are basically saving people from cardiac uh, problems, we all live longer thanks to that. And Israel is therefore helping create the old age problem of the economies of the world. 
as well as the device you see here of a company that is helping uh, invalids uh, walk again. Creative society is also about creating new things, and one of the things we've learned is that we also should look at the creative side, at the media side, uh, gaming, uh, media, films, and so forth. And that has been amazingly successful somehow. I'm not sure why. If you look at the bottom, in the last six years, we have had six nominations for the Oscars in the foreign film category. Now, for a nation that is 0.01% of the world population, uh, it's not bad. Um, I'd like to skip, this presentation was done with Korean colleagues, so I'll skip the Korean side, which was covered by uh, the ambassador, but coming back to the issue of uh, synergies. So in summary, uh, this is a repetition of what was said earlier. Uh, when you look at startups, in, in Korea they're often more domestic because they have a 50 million people market. We do not, so we, we tend to be global from day one. Uh, your market is dominated by large groups. We don't have that, good or bad, we do not. Um, a lot of the management of the Korean environment is done top-down, where, whereas ours is bottom-up. Nobody comes close to Koreans when it comes to globalization of existing product, when it looks at ex execution. Uh, but Israel is good at time to market and innovating new things. So the question really uh, uh, is what can we do together? What can we learn from each other? So the ambassador covered what Korea wants to do. Let me tell you what Israel wants to do or would like to do. Our biggest challenge today, as I told you, our model is like Korea. The, our, our specific model is getting to a plateau. So the question is, where do we grow it from here? And one of the answers, a very important answer, is Asia. Historically, everything the Israeli uh, uh, technology industry did was U.S. oriented. It was U.S. know-how, it was U.S. capital, it was going public in the U.S., it was being sold to U.S. companies. Remember the list I showed you previously of R&D centers in Israel? Now, we all know the discussion here presents the fact that the world is no longer just U.S. based. Do we have adequate models to go to Korea, to China, to, to Japan? Not enough. The world is lacking some of those. There are many difficulties. Difficulties that are a result of differences in culture, uh, different uh, business practices, different ethic systems, different approaches to intellectual property, and the list of why not is pretty long. But the opportunity is somewhere else. The opportunity is by doing, not by not doing. Uh, personally, uh, many years ago, I was involved in creating the first ever joint venture between Israel, an Israeli company and the Japanese one. Everybody who knew me told me that this would be the end of my career. Uh, and, and statistically, they were right. We went on to create the first venture in Japan that was successful. We reached $100 million sales in Japan, very profitable. And you need one success story to have more people come over. So I think I, I go by the concept of let's, let's, let's look for success stories. But indeed, what Israel would be looking for in a relationship is the Asia ang angle. It's the business models. It's how to work together. And it's not trivial. You look at the large Korean or Chinese or even Japanese uh, conglomerates, the approach is not a win-win approach. So they also have to learn and we have to learn how to work with each other. We all know it's very hard for a small company to work with a big one. It's also difficult for a big one to work with a small one. Very difficult. But there's got to be a, an ability to respect each other and use each other. Now, my suggestion is the following. I realize that uh, Korea would like to get more venture capital and more startups in Korea, and that's great, and maybe we can help. But for us, the big opportunity is by basically creating a linear model. What do I mean? We in Israel have too much innovation. We don't have enough capital to support all the innovation we have. We don't have enough management to do that. Let me give you an example. In the medical device field, we have today 700 companies. 700 companies. Now, assume that each company needs at least one doctor, one physician on the management team. Where do we get 700 doctors to participate in startups? If they start leaving the hospital, God, God knows what's going to happen. So we are now looking at, at some business models, some of which you have here. I want to remind you that Pluristem in the high-tech field has created the recent uh, licensing. Samsung, I'm being specific here, has done several investments, both in venture capital and in uh, startup companies, a lot of trade missions. So there's a lot of activity going on, including the binational Israel-Korea uh, venture. But we need to take it to the next, next step. 
and the next step is indeed, if I would focus on one specific topic, one specific challenge, is how do you link innovation platforms, which we have here, we don't need another one, to a scale platform, which we don't have, but you have, Korea has. Uh, and what are the ways that we could look for synergies? First of all, thinking about Asia-related uh, uh, strategies. So the obvious ones or, 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 or the first areas that we are already looking at have to do with uh, uh, VLSI, telecom, and mobile. These are huge industries in Korea. Korea is a world leader. So a lot of that has been covered by the previous presentation, and there's a lot of work going on. Uh, for example, one of our portfolio companies is a chip company here in Israel who has created an, an alliance together with both LG and Samsung, and Sony, by the way, to promote new uh, VLSI technology. So that is sort of obvious. But what is not obvious, what can create win-win situations, is by looking at new areas of collaboration and synergy which can create significant, and I venture to say very significant, opportunities. If I was to identify the top two, they would be in, uh, top two, they would be in the life sciences, namely medical devices and life sciences, and the, others, the second one uh, would be in clean tech. We all have great respect for the Korean drive towards a clean and green economy. We all know that Seoul wants to be the greenest uh, city in the world. We respect that. I wish we could say the same about Tel Aviv, but not anytime soon. Uh, we have a lot of investment in clean tech, in water technologies, in uh, purification technologies, in uh, uh, energy um, uh, savings mo models in reducing consumption of, electro of uh, electricity in uh, urban areas, especially in uh, air conditioners. So there are many, many companies who are dealing with that and who are finding their path to market in, the, in, in Asia limited. So basically, uh, what should be done, or what we can do, which holds great promise, is indeed to bring together businesses and probably with some support for, from uh, governments, try to create uh, uh, joint ventures around uh, these areas. Now let me give you an example. I mentioned to you, and do I still have a minute? Oh, you're, you're, you're the owner. So being a businessman, you know, it, it's all very nice to put up concept, but do we have co concrete ideas? So let me give you a few. Let's take the medical device area. We all want to invest in medical devices. We all want to invest in medical technologies. Why? Because everybody wants to live longer. Everybody wants to live well longer. Nobody has enough money to afford that. Today there was in the press in Israel that we have problems that people who are retired, say at above the age of 65, don't have enough money to support their parents who are 90. So we are getting now to having two generations at the same time who are out of work and in need of support. The answers to these things are not by reducing their quality of life and, 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 uh, and pensions but are basically by creating technology and technology-based services and technology-based products and concepts that will increase our quality of life as we try to move forward. So, I'll give you an example. I mentioned 700 medical device companies in Israel. What is the common denominator for all of them? All of them are US-focused, practically all of them. Why? Because in medical, to date, the dominance of the US FDA across the world is total. So if I want to build a successful company, I have no choice but to go to the world's richest market and to the most influential market in terms of FDA. And that takes years. We have to have clinical trials, then we have to go to the FDA, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then we need to get reimbursement from the insurance company. That is a seven to 15 year cycle. There is no time, there is no money, there is no management, there is no focus to look at Asia. But hang on. Most of the world population is there. So we now have a mismatch between opportunity and business. So what do we need? We need very simple business structures, many of them, where an Israeli technology could venture with a company out of Asia, let's take Korea for example, and say, okay, you take the Asian opportunity. It could be a sister company, it could be a joint venture, it could be a, uh, uh, a subsidiary, it doesn't matter now. And what you can have is that the Asian partner will take care of 
KFDA registration, SFDA registration, local clinical trials. You can share clinical trials information then between Asia and America. You can work at double the speed because you have more clinical trials. The Asian side will take the products to market locally. It can also probably do local R&D, local completion of product. It could also probably do a better job at the manufacturing, which means that actually the Israeli company can now buy products from its Asian partner for resale in America. So all of a sudden, what are we getting? Lower cost in a high cost environment, higher speed in what is typically a low speed environment, and a faster way to create value for your uh, investors and to deal with more patients. This is an unbelievable scale that can be developed by, by doing what I call a sequential approach, A and B. So you take innovation that has already been developed. You don't begin with phase one, but something that's already proven or semi-proven, which has significant markets where you have complementarity, and you scale it up in Asia, uh, in Korea. Why in Korea? You have given all the reasons why in Korea, so I, I, I have no need to repeat that. The same holds true about clean tech. Now, there is competition in Asia today that does not exist in Europe, and that is who are going to be the cleanest economy. We don't have, you know, we have competition here between Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Haifa, but <laughs> green is not one of the topics that is being discussed, unfortunately. It is that situation. That kind of competition exists today between Beijing, Seoul, Hong Kong, Singapore, for the quality of life of their people, for their ability to go to school without wearing anything on your mouth, to want to attract people rather than to lose them. I think it's wonderful. It's great. It's part of the future. Again, same model that I've explained to you earlier. Combined between early stage situations, respect what they bring to you. You can bring part of the team to Korea, no problem. You can bring Korea over here, Koreans over here, assuming we solve the visa problems. Create Asia-oriented products. They have to be probably cheaper than we sell in the US, but that can be done. And as a result, you get much stronger opportunities in all the areas of clean tech, which are primarily, in my mind, c reduction of energy, especially el electric energy, water treatment of all uh, kinds, whether saving water or whether uh, uh, purifying water. Uh, and, and there are several others that we can uh, talk to. That also, by the way, deals with, uh, with uh, all the way to software. When you look at uh, iPhone-based navigation tools for your cars, we end up saving uh, gasoline when we drive to uh, work. So even that impacts our economy today. So what are we looking for? We are looking to create, as, me and as mentioned earlier, uh, success stories. We believe we have some initial uh, models, but we're still lacking success stories. We think we've identified collectively some wonderful areas of opportunity. I'm trying to focus on areas that are complementary Remember, you want to create a VC and startup community in Korea. You want to in create an ecosystem. We think it's a good thing. But it's going to take a whole generation before it impacts the economy as a whole. It took us more than a generation. So that's what it takes. So it's good to do, but it's hard to compress. So what do we do to get meaningful early successes? This model. And with that, I wish all of us uh, a, wonderful st a wonderful success story, a great joint trip and hopefully a wonderful lunch. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Shalosh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, it was indeed inspiring. And uh, I would like to thank you all for coming to our uh, first Creative Economy Seminar today. Uh, I hope uh, I will be able to see you at the second Creative Economy Seminar, hopefully next year. And uh, thank you to all the speakers here. You did a wonderful job today.